Hi, I'm Joe Harris, president of the University of Oklahoma. I want to welcome you to our conversations with the president. This platform gives me the chance to talk to some of the great people who make OU so special. Make sure you're subscribed to Conversations with the President, and you'll be the first to know when new episodes are released. Let's get started. All right, first thing first, during our last conversation, we laid the groundwork for the wonderful research we are doing here at the University of Oklahoma. Again, I want to thank the greatest name in research, our Vice President for Research uh, and Partnerships, Tomas Diaz de la Rubia, and men's golf coach Ryan Hibble for joining the show. In case you haven't heard that episode, uh, please subscribe to Conversations with the President wherever you listen to podcasts so you can hear all past and future episodes. Now I want to start off today's show by talking about our alumni and what they've done uh, in response to the requests we've had. Um, over the last couple of years, we have told our alumni we have a strategic plan. Uh, we would like for you to invest in it. We truly think that it changes lives. And our alumni have responded in remarkable ways. So if we look back at the, at the year 2021, in that year, our alumni responded by donating a record 200 and $37 million to the University of Oklahoma and our purpose. And this past year, which closed June 30, uh, it was an astonishing year. Uh, shattering last year's record, uh, thanks to Amy Noah, who has led that, the foundation, Guy Patton, and all of those involved with our alumni. We shattered the record of $237 million, and our alumni provided $317 million in donations and special gifts. Uh, that truly changes lives. There's no way to express my gratitude for what that does for our students, uh, for our research, and the way that we impact uh, our state and nation in healthcare and beyond. So uh, thanks to all, all of you for doing that. There's a couple of other areas I want to recognize. And at the last episode, they had me reading from a teleprompter, which some said wasn't so great. So they've given me cards today. I'm going to read from those. We're going to see if that's better. Um, I do want to acknowledge three areas uh, since our last show that have been recognized both in the state and nationally. The first is the College of Nursing. Uh, Dean Hoff has done remarkable work there. We were recognized um, uh, since the last show for being the number one uh, college of nursing in the state of Oklahoma and ninth best in the Southwest region. Uh, we all know the critical work that OU Health does and that our nurses do there and around the state uh, in saving lives every single day, especially over the pandemic the last couple of years, uh, being the top school matters in a huge way. Uh, two more accolades to throw out there. Um, both of these are actually in the same college, the College of Atmospheric and Geographic Sciences. Uh, we have two number one national rankings. Uh, the first one is the School of Aviation. Our School of Aviation, uh, which is important in training in the critical area of flying and the aviation-related sciences, we were just ranked number one in the country uh, for students that want to receive an education uh, in aviation. Remarkable amount of work. In our last podcast, we heard from Tomas Diaz de la Rubia, and he talked about research and partnerships and preparing our students for their careers. Those partnerships in this uh, number one school of aviation here at OU include those with the United States Air Force, Southwest Airlines, and all of the other major airlines. So that's exciting uh, news. And then finally, among the bragging of top national rankings, uh, the next one is our School of Meteorology. Uh, so many know what's being accomplished here at OU. Our School of Meteorology is ranked number one in the country, and in terms of national research dollars, uh, that college receives more in atmospheric sciences than any college or university in the nation, uh, saving lives every single day with the work that they do. Uh, it is stunning, the work of our National Weather Center, our School of Meteorology, the College itself of Atmospheric and Geographic Sciences, and their work with the federal agency in charge of that. We call it NOAA, but it's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Agency, um, is truly important. And later in today's show, uh, and yes, you have to stay on for all of it, uh, later in today's show, we're going to hear from a new uh professor in the college who's doing incredible work. His name is Matt Flournoy, and we're going to hear from him in just a minute. Uh, our first guest who we're going to welcome to the scene, to our set, to this remarkable and stunning and dynamic set, uh, is Dr. David Surratt. Uh, Dr. Surratt, would you join us, please? 
Hey, Dr. Sherratt, um, you've been here for three and a half years, yeah. and I want to get into that. But first of all, I was uh, earlier today, I was looking out of my window in the president's office, and I saw a gentleman in a sport coat going across <laughs> campus uh, on a scooter uh, heading to a meeting. Was that you? That might have been me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. There's there's uh, rumors that there's random footage from students uh, catching me on the scooters. Yeah. I, uh, but yeah, it's uh, that's true. Don't tell don't take uh, risk management or don't tell Keisha either because no. she's worried that I'm going to fall on the scooter at some point well, in time. So, that, yeah. that could go viral. Um, <laughs> hey, thrilled that you're here. Uh, before we get into the details of it, right now we're sitting here a couple of days before the first day of school. Students have been here many, certainly the freshmen over the last week and a half. Tell us about this year's class and this moment in time on campus. Yeah, I'm excited about it, right? So we had kickoff last week. You saw the energy that was happening there with uh, the uh, cheer squad. You had the pride there. You had faculty, staff, and over 4,000 new students come to campus. So you felt the energy here in Norman. And you've got students obviously joining us at HSC in Tulsa. I've got staff there too. I'm excited about that. But uh, we think about a lot of the energy um, when you have new students coming to that stadium for the first time and feeling that that excitement. Like it was, it was huge. It was palpable, right? It was. And, and especially incredible. with these first year students right now, right? Yeah. They, they've lost a couple years to the pandemic, right? In terms yeah. of their high school experience. And so they were super grateful, super energized. Uh, we got through move in. Uh, we're in the middle of Camp Crimson right now. Uh, I'm getting excited for next week. So. Yeah, it's amazing. And for those who haven't been here for a while, over the last two years, and it took a year to develop, Dr. Surratt put together a program where all entering freshmen have the opportunity to be a part of what has been known and is known today as Camp Crimson. Um, but your move-in is actually a, a week before it used to be, which creates all kinds of threats and dangers, <laughs> um, but, but allows the freshmen to come in here and hopefully all feel connected to the university. I walked into the stadium uh, this past Friday evening, and there were, like you said, almost 4,700 uh, students all learning the cheers and chants and the traditions of the university. Um, that's exciting, and that's a product of what you and your team have done. Yeah, we're in year two. Uh, last year was tough just because we were on the onset of the pandemic in the middle of it. Um, this year feels more normal than, than years past, but the big thing that people need to recognize, too, about this Camp Crimson versus the previous one, right, was uh, previous one was multiple small meetings um, during the summertime, which it caused issues for um, international out-of-state students to travel here and actually participate in camp. Um, it had a disconnect there. We also worked with our Greek community, especially Panhellenic Recruitment, who traditionally for maybe 30 plus years was actually the first ones to arrive and do their recruitment for a thousand women and then have an orientation for the rest of our students. And we wanted to flip that. We wanted people to be oriented to what it means to be an OU student first and then talk about ways in which you connect to communities within community, right? So first have that OU identity and then next, get a sense of how you can develop more friendships and connections on campus too. So it's been awesome. It's remarkable. And yeah. it's all part of a, a clear and coherent strategy. Uh, and it's also a product of your experiences. So yeah. you've received two of your three degrees from the University of Oklahoma. Yep. Um, but you might, you might just tell um, the listeners and the hundreds of thousands of viewers uh, that watch this show, <laughs> um, you, might, uh, you might tell them a, a bit about your background, where you've been, yeah. um, and, uh, uh, and, and how those are, are being brought to bear to help OU students. Today yeah, no, I've, I'm a proud OU graduate, uh, two degrees here, right, and my doc work at George Washington University. So uh, funny enough, when I think about even how I chose a profession, started here, I tell people my wife is responsible for that because she was the one who applied to be an RA, and I was like, what else do I have to do? I'll apply to and see what happens. And we both got selected, right? So OU was the starting place for me to get involved in student affairs. And so um, real quick, student affairs, what it is, right? So when people think about that, they don't really know fully what it is. But I, I tell people we're in charge and responsible for learning outside the classroom. So um, as a result of our programs and services, 20 plus services across all of our campuses, right? We are helping students develop personally um, and we help them with their career development. We help them understand their community impact through service and engagement on campus, mm -hmm. and we help them with their well-being and staying safe on campus. And that's kind of the three learning aims that we have for our division, right? Um, but yeah, I, uh, I came to this profession because of students. Um, the funny story is I left OU, went to Penn State University, at my Penn State Mon Alto specifically, and tiny campus, um, I go there, and in my first year, funny enough, I wasn't making a lot of money, and the students there, um, found out that I didn't have plans for Thanksgiving because I couldn't afford to take a flight for Thanksgiving and Christmas and come mm -hmm. back home to Oklahoma. I was raised here, right? And so when they found that out at Thanksgiving, um, I was put on a, a program. We had a comedian show up. And uh, before he starts his set, he says, is, is David Surratt in the audience? So he calls me up. I was like, hey, what's going on? He's like, hey, um, I've got something for you. 
Um, he hands me this bag, and in it is a plane ticket to fly to Tulsa and uh, a, a card from the residents uh, in the community that I helped support when I was working in the residence halls there, too. That's true. And so I tell people all the time that this work, it's about those things I mentioned, about developing that experience, but I found it because of the students. And I realized I didn't need the ticket, but it was more so a reflection of um, thinking that I was having an impact in the community and not even realizing at the time, too. So it was, it was a huge thing for me. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it amazing? I yeah. mean, the, these jobs are incredible, and the ability to be around students is uh, is beyond special. Yeah, yeah. I, I know you love it for sure, yeah. and sometimes you tire me out the way you run around too sometimes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, absolutely. <laughs> um, so, so when we think about, so we've spoken on this program a bit about the strategic plan. Uh, Tomas was on the show yeah. um, for our most recent episode talking about as only he can, the strategic research verticals and horizontals. Uh, and, um, and we've talked a lot about the strategic plan. When we think about um, the life of a student, the life of a university, its success, uh, wh where does student affairs intersect uh, in, that, in that plan? Yeah, no, when we when you talk about those learning objectives, right, when we talk about personal development, I'm talking about sometimes uh, when our students are engaging in our different programs and services, whether it be in Greek life or in one of our 500 plus uh, registered, uh, registered student organizations on campus, sometimes this is their first learning opportunity in how to engage in teams, how to lead. Um, they're interviewing for leadership positions and roles. Sometimes it's their first interview they've ever actually had. Hmm. Um, so those are the, the things that are happening throughout that time. Uh, within the Division of Student Affairs too, we, we employ between probably 400 to 600 students in some capacity on campus. And so they're actually learning through their job requirements about how to engage, right? On top of that, um, they're connecting to our career center, right? So they're learning about how to access a uh, handshake, our career management tool, to um, interview with potential uh, employers for internships, for full-time jobs, either while they're here or postgraduate. Um, so when we talk about that, that career kind of destination piece of it, that's a big part of the plan, I think, that we're trying to make sure that people understand um, that there are benefits to getting this, this education and getting that degree and uh, leaving with success, right? Um, the other pieces, too, is about belonging. So when we talk about the ways in which students connect, you've got move-in, you've got camp, you've right. got um, all of the ways in which we engage with our services on campus. On top of that, making sure they're successful and actually uh, moving through their, their experience in, in education here. Uh, we also have the public service arm with Goddard Health Services, Fitness and Recreation. If we don't have healthy students, they don't succeed here. They don't stay here and they don't thrive, right? Yeah. So it's all kind of encompassed into, in this kind of package to support the strategic plan for sure. Yeah. yeah. No, it's incredible. I mean, we, we want for the students what we received during our time at OU, yeah. both of us being undergrads, receiving undergrads from OU, this idea that you belong, yeah. right? That you're not just, you didn't just get into the university, but you belong here. And then those, those life lessons that you learn outside of the classroom uh, about how to be successful and what definitions of success we want for ourselves that will be fulfilling. And uh, I love the way you and your team approach it. Uh, and it really is stunning, I, you know, to, to watch you know, my perception of what student affairs did when I was a student uh, is very different from what it is in this role. And uh, you really are there for the greatest triumphs, the greatest changes, and also tragedies uh, that occur in the community. And yeah. uh, it's a job that we're, we're really lucky to have uh, you and your team, uh, you know, in. Yeah, thank you. Now, when you, when you move the equivalent of a small city onto campus in a matter of days, there's things are, are both good and bad that are, are bound to happen in the life cycle of their time here too. So you're right. I mean, there's moments where um, I, I tell people whenever I th they ask me about my job, I said, I could wake up and I could be in front of a group of thousands of students like at the stadium, uh, giving them support, talking about our services, what it means to be here, right? Um, I could be meeting with small groups or looking over strategy on the operations. Uh, or at the end of the day, I could actually be having a really difficult conversation with a parent or family member who may have lost a student, right? Yeah. And trying to talk through what that means for them, how to support them. And so the spectrum of the work that, that I do and get to do every yeah. single day, um, it, it, is, it is massively uh, large in scope, but I always tell people it's a chosen labor. Uh, yeah. It's one that I appreciate. Uh, because I remember what it was like, like you, to be here at OU's campus and kind of figure out what that looks like. I, I joke with people on move-in day all the time that my dad, he pulled up to Walker Tower, <laughs> he stayed in the truck the whole time, 
and said, uh, I got to watch your stuff. So you got to move your stuff. So I'm moving my yeah. stuff up, up the, the steps to the fifth floor Walker tower to get in there. And it's a melee, right? Nothing, yeah. nothing like it we was have madness. Now. For me, it was Adam's tower, right? And, yeah. and, and dad was really busy, but mom came and almost didn't leave, but it was, it was madness trying to get in. Uh, At least your mom came. So my mom, she came. <laughs> she came in the summer when I uh, got my classes, and I don't think she could see her her baby boy go to school. So she never came back to visit me on campus until yeah. my junior year well, of I undergrad. Don't, I don't blame her, not because I wouldn't want to visit you, but because <laughs> I just dropped off my son Joseph, my oldest, uh-huh. you know, for um, for the dorms yeah. last week, and no one's ever had an easier time with their first kid going to college than me. He literally is going to OU. <laughs> And I walk them over to the dorms. The move-in process is not what we experience, uh-huh. right? This is like a finely tuned, personalized, you know, service. It's amazing how, yep. what the team does. And my biggest issue was I had to walk away because I got dust in my eyes. And <laughs> allergy it, season. Right, I know. allergy it season. All. I was crying like a baby uh, <laughs> and tried best for him not to, to see it. So I know how your mom feels. It's hard to, it's hard to, be, to be around and watch your you kid gotta, go. You got you to keep it low key for, yeah. for Joe. I'm just no, telling that's right. you. That's right. I've got to play it try, cool. Try but play the it truth cool. of the matter is, as parents, and I know we shouldn't look at this way, but, but the idea of sending your, your, your son or daughter off to college, and you know that they are adults technically, but there's so much to learn and so many mistakes that have to happen for them to fully develop. And to me, the essence of what Student Affairs does and the greatest hope we have is that uh, we're there to, to help, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, to make that student uh, feel connected and to help them grow into these fully formed um, uh, adults that can feel fulfilled and realize their potential in their own lives and to help other people. And it's a big handoff. It really is. As a parent, you you have them for 18 years um, if they're a traditional student. Mm -hmm. And then you don't. And so, you know, from my perspective, I'm just grateful to you and to Student Affairs uh, because uh, a critical part of the education happens in the classroom. And a critical part of the education happens outside the classroom. Absolutely, yeah. And the truth of the matter is, for the OU experience, the on-campus, in-person experience, um, to be realized, both those kinds of growth have to happen in a way that intersect uh, and come together for that full experience. And so uh, when we think about the various sides of the university, student affairs is, is an absolutely critical part of that. And yeah, I tell people for every hour they're spending in the classroom, they're spending eight to ten hours outside of it. So there's learning happening on all parts of the experience for our students for sure. And so I'm grateful to, to have your support. Also, your experiences as a student really speaks to you wanting to kind of pour into that experience for our students too. So that's really helpful and super supportive for our, our staff for sure. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's helpful. I know you spent time uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, yep. and I spent time on the East Coast at a university there. And to me, it's really great to have that variety of experiences for you both as a student and working at other universities where you can bring the best and the lessons from the mistakes that are made by others. And, Absolutely. you know, for me, I, I really thought, well, um, maybe some of these East and West Coast universities have something that we don't have. And while there are things to learn and take, you know, the overall connectivity that was there for me in 85 um, and, you know, for you 10, 15 years later, yep, yep. Um, hopefully th- th- we're able to, to repay that in a way that, um, that uh, you know, our students have the benefit of those experiences. And I know I'm like you. I mean, we talk about it all the time. I'm, I'm so thankful to be a part of it and yeah. thankful to have you there. On a practical level, you know, we do know that increasingly students are asking the question, you know, uh, as they're looking at universities, um, okay, what happens after? Uh, can you talk about um, uh, what we're doing, what you're doing and your team are doing at our university around the idea of preparation of students uh, for their careers and connection to careers? Yeah, for sure. So the, you, uh, definitely there was a uh, recent announcement that went out to the community about investment in the Career Center, right? So one of the biggest things that you have to have is actual staff to support the capacity for students to be able to engage with them, right? So we looked at ratios and kind of looked at that and studied that more closely to see what's a, a more uh, beneficial ratio for our students to, to, to our staff. The two areas and buckets that I'd say are the largest investments in the Career Center are um, staff supporting employer relations and reaching out to potential employers and folks who could hire our students for internships and actual jobs. Uh, and the other one is around career coaching, right? How are we 
teaching students how to uh, leverage their experiences on a college campus, uh, whether it be in traditional ways, um, like uh, internship opportunities and what, whatnot, but also non-traditional ways. How are they making sure they sell themselves when it comes to their experiences on campus uh, in various ways? Like I told you, we have a lot of students who work and volunteer on campus. And um, funny story, I, I had a student worker in my office who got a job recently in Oklahoma City. And she mentioned that her first time interviewing for a job actually was for um, executive, uh, an executive position for Dance Marathon on campus. And she said, because of that experience with a panel um, a presentation and interview with that, it translated to her employer interview that was a panel discussion, panel interview, and it made her feel more confident, more comfortable, right? Mm. And so we think about those ways that we're engaging with our, our students all the time about um, how we're engaging with students about career preparation, how we're connecting them to employers, and then how we're actually measuring that data to make sure we can tell the story about the investment in an OU education leading to uh, transformative opportunities professionally after they graduate. Yeah, now that, that's really it. I mean, you know, people all the time will ask, you know, well, I have this opportunity versus OU, yeah. which one should I take? And the answer is, where's the value, right? It's yeah. excellence and access. Yeah. And it's in the classroom, it's outside of the classroom, it's building that whole person. And the response has been pretty good over the last couple of years. Uh, we tremendous. had a record class this year, and I did the intro to you by bragging about things at OU. Um, uh, tell us about this year's class profile and, and what this year's freshman class looks like. Yeah, I mean, we've seen the announcements about the largest, most diverse class, right? When we talk about uh, what that means in, in a probably an environment nationally where there's a lot of conversations about the value of a college degree in college education, right? We see some of the, the data out there, but what I love is that OU represents um, a strong profile about the experience and also the opportunity of an OU education. Um, I love the emphasis on uh, the diversity, right? Not only around um, ethnic and racial diversity, we talked about first generation college students especially, right? Um, and the, the data oftentimes critiquing education doesn't kind of nail down and drill down further into demographics about ways in which um, first generation college students, underrepresented populations oftentimes benefit longitudinally um, in terms of earning value, wealth, um, the ability to do the things. I mean, you've got an incredible story uh, of yourself about um, how you and your family have been able to benefit from a, a, a strong education mm -hmm. and a lineage and building that up, right? So. Um, it tells a story to me about why I'm proud to be OU, why I chose OU um, in 1998 as a student. Um, I could have stayed. I would have stayed if I had a job. I would have stayed, right. but I, you know, I took some circuitous route, East Coast and West Coast, and I came back here after working at the number one public institution in the world at Berkeley. I came and I chose OU always, right? Because I know that there's so many benefits to being here in this place. Uh, on this campus, uh, in this the heart of Oklahoma too, so it's great. Yeah, well, we're I mean we're beyond blessed to have you uh, in this role the last three and a half years. Yeah. I've been in this role for three years, so um, I was lucky to get to know you in that role and um, thrilled that you're there. I'll, you know, you are uh, uh, more humble and modest about it than I am, so I'm just going to lay the numbers out there real quick. <laughs> right, largest class in the history of the yeah. university of 138 years. 4,706 freshmen in this class. Most universities are contracting, regrettably. Uh, ours is growing, and 39% of our students are from historically underrepresented groups. Mm. And the one that you've touched on that to me, I'm just absolutely so proud of. When you think about what is the dream, right? What, what, is, what is the opportunity um, that we provide uh, through higher education? And 25%, right? One in four of our students for the second year in a row coming into this freshman class are the first in the history of their family to go to college. And that changes their life, the life of their family, the life of their communities. It's stunning work and the education they receive here in the classroom. And because of your team outside of that classroom, uh, I promise you, we know a second to none. So uh, yeah. truly grateful. Thank you for being uh, on the show. Yeah. And uh, I'll probably see you a little later today in a meeting. <laughs> probably but, so. Uh, thank you for being here. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, Thanks Dr. Schrock. If you recall from our previous episode with Tomas, we spoke about the verticals and the horizontals test to follow of the great research happening here at the University of Oklahoma. I now want to welcome to the show a bright research scientist in meteorology. He comes to us from Massachusetts, where he received his undergraduate degree at Penn State in 2015 before coming to the University of Oklahoma to pursue and ultimately receive his PhD uh, in 2020, doing your postdoc work here as well. 
uh, and now as a research scientist uh, at, the, uh, at the school. He works with the Cooperative Institute. Now, this is a mouthful, so hang tight. He works with the Cooperative Institute for Severe and High-Impact Weather Research and Operations at the National Weather Center, known to all of us uh, as the acronym CERO. Um, CERO is the largest research center at the University of Oklahoma employing more than 215 uh, researchers, uh, support personnel, and students. And uh, he was recently involved in the targeted observation by radars and unmanned aircraft systems of supercells. As Oklahomans, we all know what supercells are. Uh, and this is a study that involves that. It's known as Taurus, uh, which concluded its two-year study just this last year. Uh, with that, I want to welcome Dr. Matthew Florney to the show. Uh, we're thrilled to have you here. Um, I've covered a bit of the formal things, but can you just tell us a bit about uh, your journey here to this position? Yeah, and first off, thanks so much for having me. This yeah. is a delight to chat with you about some of this stuff. Yeah, well, it's my joy, and I want to say that it's it's been really heightened by the fact that you have the greatest socks on of any <laughs> guest with uh, socks that actually have your uh, representations of your two cats. They is that do. Right? My two ginger tabbies, yes, Diego and Mowgli, got to represent them. Absolutely. Always. Yeah. Always, yes. Um, so I'm originally from Massachusetts. I grew up there, and then I did my undergraduate um, at Penn State, like you mentioned earlier. And um, while at Penn State, I had the opportunity to actually come out to Norman for a summer internship through the NOAA Ernest F. Hollings Scholarship uh, Research Program for undergrads. It's a wonderful program. Highly recommend any any undergrads to uh, take advantage of that and, and at least apply. But came out here, and I was paired up with an advisor for that project. Um, this was in between my junior and senior year. At Penn State and I fell in love with it, fell in love with the advisor too, um, uh, Dr. Mike Coniglio and he actually ended up being my master's and PhD advisor too once I uh, hightailed it back to Penn State after that summer, applied to OU for grad school and, and came right back down a year later. Um, so I came back in 2015, um, got my master's in 2017, PhD 2020. Um, during the lost, you know, the forgotten COVID years, yeah. I was a postdoc from 2020 to, to 2022 and now I'm a research scientist. So that's kind of my professional journey. Um, to Norman, Oklahoma. Yeah, so. well, that's fantastic. Whenever you tell people what you do and you describe it to a person off the street, what do you tell them that you do? That's a great question. Um, I study supercells and tornadoes. Um, sometimes I have to clarify what supercells are, but to Oklahomans, like you said, that typically isn't yeah. the case. So right. big spinny storms. I study things that spin. I'll put it that way. <laughs> um, I study severe weather that spins on a small scale. So not hurricanes, but supercells and tornadoes. A um, little bit more specifically, I study why tornadoes form in some supercells and why they don't in other supercells. So in a really hot topic in the field right now is um, definitely tornado genesis, but also failed tornado genesis and, right. and why some storms don't produce tornadoes. So that's uh, some of the hot topics in the community right now and some of the things that we're trying to observe in the field. Yeah, it's so. fantastic. And you just finished this uh, two-year study, the Taurus study. Mm -hmm. um, t tell us tell us what you can about that research study and, and what you're excited about as oh, it yeah. relates it's, to it. It's, it's all very exciting. It was delayed for 2020 and 2021 because of COVID, but we did go out there and collect data in 2019 and 2022. Um, in essence, Taurus uh, is a supercell-focused field campaign. It's a fully nomadic campaign, so we're basically following and intercepting these storms all around the Great Plains. Uh, there's a few institutions that are involved uh, from Nebraska, Texas Tech, Colorado, and a lot of folks here in Norman uh, through OU and NSSL and CRO. And we head out there to the Great Plains in our observing vehicles and equipment to sample supercells, supercell thunderstorms. And when they're there, tornadoes. And when they're not there, non-tornadic supercells. Both of them matter for us. We're not just after the tornadoes, we're after the supercells. And what we're specifically trying to get at is... Um, new regions of the storm, the supercell itself, that we haven't really observed before. Um, specifically, we call it the left flank of the supercell, but it's pretty much the area right upwind of the, of the tornado or the low-level updraft. Um, when it spins, we call it a mesocyclone. It's the most technical I'll get today, yeah, but it's the air that's flowing into those features and causing all that severe weather that, for the first time, Taurus was really able to sample not only at the ground, um, using vehicles driving around at the ground, but also with UASs and balloons aloft in that part of the storm. So what will we learn from this? Um, we haven't learned too, too much yet because we just finished it. Um, but in the coming years, we're going to analyze all that data. It's going to take probably a decade or more um, to do, which is wonderful. And we will learn about the processes within the storm, within the supercell that actually 
cause uh, the seeds for tornadoes at the ground. That's what we're after here in this project. Yeah, it's incredibly exciting. And at the top of the show, um, I spoke about the ranking of our School of Meteorology of being number one in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and we talk a lot about the teaching, the research, the service, um, uh, and, and the health care that is provided at the university. But specifically as a research scientist at this early stage in your career, uh, you've talked a bit about the, the Taurus research study, but it, as you think about um, what you hope to accomplish in your research agenda over time during your career, um, tell us a little bit about that and, and what that impact you think will be on, uh, on Oklahoma, the region, the nation, and the world. Yeah, that's kind of the golden career question. Um, I don't have it all figured out yet. Um, I certainly hope to keep on studying supercells and tornadoes. I, right now, I'm, I'm particularly interested in warnings. Um, so there's a lot of facets to the tornado warning problem and ultimately better protecting lives and property from tornadoes. That's always the ultimate goal. Unfortunately, people still die and are injured um, and people lose lots of money because of tornadoes. So we and, and I am just one part of a huge multifaceted group that tries to tackle these problems. Um, I hope to address some questions on the science side, like like Taurus, like mm -hmm. why do uh, certain things happen in supercells that cause tornadoes and why don't those things happen sometimes? Um, what actual physical processes are happening there that we still don't understand? And on the other side of the spectrum, and equally important, if not more important, is the human side, is actually, okay, Matt, now we understand the left flank of the mesocyclone and supercells. What does that actually mean for better warning these storms and actually better saving lives and property. And that depends on one, if people even get tornado warnings in the first place, whether it's from the radio, from the TV, from their phone, et cetera, from the warnings, from the sirens. Um, and then ultimately, what do they do when that happens? Is there immediate thought to go to a shelter immediately? Um, that would be great. And they'd probably save their life if they did. Or is it to go get their grandma from down the street and help her out too, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many different scenarios that we need to understand. Also, in addition to the supercell Taurus type processes to finally solve that question and, and tackle the problem of, of better saving lives and property from tornado. So in the grand scheme of things, that's what I hope to contribute to. Yeah. Isn't, I mean, to me, that's, you know, the research enterprise to me is so exciting to see where the theoretical meets the application, where, exactly. where all of this work around a very specific area um, of, of research and the partnership between, in this case, the University of Oklahoma and the federal government mm -hmm. can come together as they do in the National Weather Center, and as you say, save lives uh, and create, um, minimize economic damage, create opportunity. Um, you know, uh, oftentimes my kids will ask me now, what do you do as a college president? And the answer is I work with individuals that do amazing things for, uh, for humanity. And mm -hmm. uh, what you do is a huge part of that. And it's so much fun uh, to be able to have a conversation in a format like this, in a podcast setting, uh, because this isn't seen by so many people. Uh, the, the people in their careers like you that have committed so many years already coming here in 2015 before that at Penn State mm -hmm. um, that are, are here making a difference in the lives of so many people. Uh, unbelievably grateful and uh, can't wait to watch the trajectory of uh, your research and, uh, and its application in improving the lives of so many. Thanks. So really grateful for you being here. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. And before we end the show, I want to celebrate a member of the OU family. Congratulations to OU Law Class of 1976 alumni Dwight W. Birdwell for receiving the Medal of Honor from President Joe Biden for his bravery during the war in Vietnam. Birdwell moved to Oklahoma when he was very young, and following his heroics abroad, he served on the Judicial Appeals Tribunal for the Cherokee Nation from 1987 to 1999, having served as Chief Justice from 1995 to 1996. Birdwell distinguished himself with bravery and selflessness, serving with Troop C, 3rd Squadron, 4th Cavalry, 25th Infantry Division in January of 1968 by defending his unit against heavy fire. Even after having sustained injuries from gunfire, Birdwell refused to leave his men behind and instead led a flanking maneuver against the enemy that successfully repelled the initial attack until reinforcements arrived. Thank you to Mr. Birdwell and the countless other members of our OU family who have served in all branches of the military to protect us. 
we are forever grateful. And finally, with students returning to campus, I want to wish you all a happy and safe first semester here at OU. To all returning students, I wish you all well as you continue your individual path to success. Thank you everyone for listening to Conversations with the President. I wanna thank our guests, Dr. David Surratt and research scientist, Dr. Matthew Flournoy. Don't forget to subscribe to Conversations with the President. I'm looking forward to our next conversation.